Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dragon Plus live stream. I am your host, Bart Carroll. And this is my uh, uh, co-host every other week, Jeremy Crawford, of course. Hello, lead, everyone. Lead rules designer of Dungeons & Dragons, lead designer of the Player's Handbook, and the game's managing editor. Uh, as always, Jeremy joins us every other week to talk through Unearth Arcana and other questions and topics as they arise. Uh, we've been kind of bouncing around. It's convention season. Uh, and planning season, and we've been in and out of the office, so the schedule's been a little bit in flux, but we're looking to get back on track as soon as possible. Uh, really quickly, uh, I saw it in the chat uh, in the lobby as we were waiting to start. Uh, <laughs> the Dragon Plus. Dragon Plus is our free digital magazine app. It's available, as always, on iOS, Android, and at dragonmag.com. We have issue 24 is available now, and we are working on issue 25, which will be coming out mid-April. Uh, this is the live stream uh, that is uh, ostensibly in support of the content. We do include Unearthed Arcana content in Dragon Plus, and so we wanted to uh, take advantage of working with Mr. Crawford to pick his brain on a lot of that material as often as we can without impacting his uh, schedule. That said, your schedule, before we jump into uh, the topic at hand, your schedule is going to be uh, impacted as well. You're, you're off on another convention. That's right, speaking of conventions. <laughs> uh, this weekend is PAX East, yes. and we'll be having another episode of Acquisitions Incorporated. Yes. Uh, the previous two episodes that I've DM'd are available on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, so anyone who hasn't seen them, uh, dive in. You'll get to see uh, the group's crazy adventures in the world of Ravnica, uh, which will be continuing this Friday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time. Eastern time, because yes. we'll be in Boston. Uh, it, we always run everything on our channel schedule in Pacific time, uh, only because it's convenient to us here in the office. But yes, I suppose that's... We'll move to Greenwich Mean Time shortly, and then everyone <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> will standardize it that way. Uh, uh, I, I can promise the game will be zany, uh, <laughs> like the previous two. Uh, there are some crazy things coming. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen. Yes. I, I, I love that feeling as a DM, where I have, you know, I have some things planned, but we'll see, we'll see what the players <laughs> decide to do with what I've set up. Uh, and we do have the uh, previous two episodes as files. We've run it as a vodcast a couple of weeks ago, so we'll look to, to make sure we do so again, uh, either, either leading up to or, or right after uh, your game. So Excellent. Uh, people were, were surprised that, that you weren't already in PAX, and uh, I was delighted <laughs> because we, we managed to, uh, to, to keep you here for one extra day for, uh, for Dragon Plus here. Yeah, yeah. For anyone who's going to be at PAX, if you see me, please uh, do say hi. I always love seeing all of you, but I'm actually going to be there only for one day. I'm just going to wow. be there for Friday okay. to DM the game, yeah. uh, and then I'm going to be flying to California because my family uh, has had some health things going on with uh, my stepdad, so I'm actually going to go out to be with my mom uh, in California. Uh, but the show must go on, as they say, so I will be in Boston for that one day uh, to run the game. Uh, which, it's appropriate we're talking about the Artificer today because one of the characters in that game is actually mentioned in the Artificer class write-up. Uh, the Artificer Vi, who is a gnome who has been appearing in the previous two episodes of Acquisitions Incorporated. <laughs> and she is the Artificer's Artificer, a, a planes-walking master inventor. Uh, who's had an important role in the background uh, in the story that we're exploring right now in Ravnica. Very cool. So yes, we're, we're glad you're here today. We'll, we'll look forward to you uh, DMing the PAX game and best of uh, luck with everything in California. Thank you. Uh, we did speak with Jeremy a couple of weeks ago at this point when the Artificer uh, first came out in Unearthed Arcana. We ran through a little bit of an overview of, of the material. We thought we would uh, quickly reintroduce it. Last time we, we sort of left off uh, on or around the homunculus. We would talk a bit further through. You had lots of questions. Uh, we, we, we <laughs> we've compiled a lot of the questions, so we also want to make sure that we definitely do have time to address your 
questions today. Uh, we have them written down here. So three pages of them, no yeah, less. Yeah. And this was uh, and me trying to get rid of some duplicates already, and there were still lots of questions in the chat, in uh, Twitter as well. So thank you. Uh, as always, if you do have mm -hmm. questions, please do put them in chat. Please preface them with question. Uh, if we don't get around to them this time, we do compile them every time. And I see that our uh, first raffle is underway as well. Again, uh, Dragon Plus, we used to stream on Tuesdays. We have moved to Wednesdays. I saw that question come up as well, just to sort of uh, smooth out some of our internal streaming schedule. So this is our new normal date and time, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. And as mentioned, we are looking to do raffles each and every time as a sort of a small thanks for all of you tuning in for an hour of your day. So we're giving out a d, &D shirt and some WizKids unpainted minis in each of our two raffles. So please uh, do enter. And uh, there you go. Let's jump right back into the Artificer. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, we sort of left things off at the homunculus, one of my favorite words to pronounce. It is a delightful <laughs> word. It is a delightful word. It can be a torturous word to spell. <laughs> to, 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 and, and a little bit of D&D trivia, this word, if you go back to some first edition books, mm -hmm. was frequently misspelled in those books. <laughs> and so, so throughout the history of D&D, &D, this word has had various spellings. <laughs> uh, we, we are trying to hold the line these days to actually spelling this word correctly. Uh, so just as sort of a jumping off point, we did, again, as mentioned, collect a lot of your questions. There were a few that were artificial, artifice, <laughs> artificer general. Uh, and so why don't, why don't we start, start uh, with those. Uh, JM asks, and I like it because there's a compliment buried in here. I really like the artificer and can't fault you on the video, the last live stream that we did. <laughs> but why split at third? Lots of abil abilities feel shifted back unchanged from a first level archetype split. And hopefully this wasn't one of the ones that I was not meant to. Uh, no, that is, that is right. <laughs> uh, no, it's a great question. Uh, so uh, as many of you, or if not all of you watching know, each class gets a subclass choice and mm -hmm. that choice comes in at first, second, or third level. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, uh, Really, it seems, if I'm understanding it correctly, the heart of the question is, were these subclasses originally designed to kick in at first level mm. and simply shifted back to third? Branch immediately or branch a little right. bit after you've got your feet wet in the class? And, and so the answer is no, they were not originally designed for first level. Mm -hmm. uh, we designed this class uh, to uh, get its subclass at second or third. Uh, as I was doing various de design revisions, it kept bouncing around between those two levels, not with first. Um, first level was al always actually in our early designs of this version of the class, uh, too overloaded in fact. Uh, at one point you were getting uh, not only your magical tinkering and your spell casting at first level, but you were also getting infused item at first level, which uh, made first level in this class like this this jewel that everyone who uses multi-classing was going to want to oh. dive into just for one level <laughs> to suddenly be able to get spells, get magical tinkering, and get to infuse magic items. Uh, so so the, uh, the, the subclass features are uh, tuned for third level. Uh, but if, if you are reading them and you feel like they could be uh, pumped up in some way, that's great feedback to give. When we do release the survey, I've gotten some questions on Twitter about when do we plan on releasing the survey for mm. this class. Normally, uh, we would do it within uh, a few weeks right, of releasing. Weeks about right. But we decided since we're planning on releasing some more goodies uh, for this class that the feedback would be most useful for this class's future if we get your feedback once you see uh, all of those goodies uh, combined with the stuff you've already reviewed. Uh, so survey is definitely on the way, uh, but we want to time it to really maximize uh, how good of the feedback we get to ensure we are listening to you and continuing to refine this class in the way that's going to make 
the most people happy. Uh, all right, so survey says it's coming soon. <laughs> yes. Uh, the raccoon asks, how much further do you expect the artificer to get iterated? Is it close to completion, or do you feel there's much further to go? So I can't answer this question definitively until I see the survey feedback. Mm. Uh, we feel like the class is definitely on solid ground in terms of uh, its infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, many of its content pieces. I could certainly see us shuffling some things around, renaming some things, adding in some new bits. That's always a part of our iteration process. You know, once we see the playtest feedback, once we also uh, look at how you know, our thinking on the class is evolving as we analyze it, always some things start to evolve. But overall, I'd say the ground is now solid under our feet, meaning we can head forward. But there could still be a lot of changes ahead based on uh, the feedback we get. I, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to playing it. I haven't had a chance to play it myself, although in our Friday office game, my current character has started taking uh, wildly irresponsible risks <laughs> with, with the hope that, like, well, now, now I have to play, uh, play the artificer. There's, there's nothing I can do here. That is, that, is, that is always a funny feeling when you're playing D&D and you start jonesing for that other character. Yes, I know. Yeah. Like I, I, uh, my, my, because I was playing the centaur uh, cleric of the order domain mm -hmm. to play test that, and now it's like, well, okay, I've, I've got a handle on it. <laughs> I want to so it, it, it's really funny because in my home game, one of my players has been playing a cleric for over a year now, but he has made it really clear he is jonesing to switch over to a wizard. Yeah, and I keep telling him. If he wants to retire his cleric, he can. I mean, that, hey, <laughs> everyone out there, DMs and players, it's actually okay to retire a character. Yeah. You know, characters can have other things going on in their lives that might call them away. Family obligations, obligations to uh, an organization they're attached to. They could leave for temporarily, permanently. You can decide it. Uh, but this player basically has put it on me to kill the character <laughs> off. <laughs> and it's like, I, I'm not just going to like summarily execute this character <laughs> so that he can play a wizard. I, but I empathize with that player. <laughs> That's me as a player. It's for some reason, it's, it's just I want to put, it. But I want to put that onus on the dungeon master. <laughs> like, you make me make this choice. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I, I actually like that you are taking some agency as a player in that you your character is some, taking some risks. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> cleric just, just wades into battle now willy-nilly. Because <laughs> well, I, 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 as a DM, have such a strong sense of not wanting uh, to rob a player of agency when it right. comes to their character. Yes. Uh, that it's hard for me to be the one to like pull that lever of essentially a person you know wants to shoot their character out the airlock. Yeah, uh. <laughs> I need to wear like a, a secret uh, sign for Mike to recognize. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's do a, it. Yeah. Have them all attack me now. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be dramatic that way. It's more dramatic than my character leaving, and, and uh, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Come on, your, your character. Your character can like leave to become a gardener, or like yeah, d take up pottery or something. <laughs> Retire on, on a positive note. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. So if I were to make an artificer as my next character, uh, I, I uh, I've got two choices here. Going back to third level, the branching off. You've got the uh, alchemist at uh, on one end, and then the artillerist at the other. Mm -hmm. And we we spoke a bit. We kind of left off last time, uh, just getting into the artillerist's spell. Uh, we were uh, now that memory serves. We we got about to uh, the discussion of inclusion of the wall of force, as mm -hmm. the artillerist, uh, not just firing out but also defending the the, the ground uh, mm -hmm. that they're firing from. Yep. Are there other elements uh, starting from there of the artificer in general of the artillerist in specific? The infusions that you would like to uh, talk through further before we get more into uh, into the questions at hand. Uh, let's do the artillerist, okay. and then let's bounce back to uh, the base class, okay. and then we'll take more questions. All right. So, the artillerist. Yes. One of the things that's important to keep in mind, and I touched on this in our last episode, 
that when designing this version of the, the Artificer, we're not only uh, incorporating the playtest feedback we got on the last version, but we're also embedding the class more firmly in the Eberron soil that mm -hmm. it originally came from, mm -hmm. uh, inspired by uh, the release last year of the Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron on the DMs Guild. Uh, we wanted to make sure we were doing right by uh, the Artificer's roots. To be clear, we're doing that not out of sort of a slavish devotion to uh, the tradition of the game. No, we're doing it because we find often our best design arises out of rich story soil. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, uh, some of the feedback we got on the previous Artificer is that it, it didn't feel grounded enough in any of our worlds. Uh, this was one of the reasons why many people were not fond of the gunsmith, mm -hmm. because uh, as cool as many of us find that character archetype, it does not have deep roots in uh, D&D's settings. And so we took that feedback to heart of let's ground this uh, in Eberron, which as a designer, <coughs> I found super useful, not only because I really dig Eberron, but also because as soon as I design any subclass, and this is true of many of the subclasses that Mike Merles and I uh, created in Xanathar's Guide, as if I can think of actual people in a world mm -hmm. occupying the subclass and having, to roll, and having a role to play in the world that goes beyond what they do in combat, always that subclass comes more to life. Mm. Uh, and so that's, that's a tip I give to all of you who are trying your hand at subclass design. Rather than starting with game mechanics, start with world, people, what is this character doing in a D&D world? Mm -hmm. And what are they doing when they're not in battle? Uh, what role do they play in society, uh, in an organization, or some other framework that gives them an identity? Uh, a person that if you saw them, you'd say, ha ha, I bet that person's a member of that subclass. Mm -hmm. And that's why we often try to have something visually distinctive, actually, about most subclasses. Uh, if you think about a lot of the subclasses we've released for the game, there's often something about them. We don't always nail this, but there's usually something about them where if you see that person in action or how they're dressed mm -hmm. or there's a particular thing they're carrying or it's like, aha, I know or at least I have a good guess right. of what subclass that person is a part of. So that leads back to the alchemist and the artillerist. A, I wanted each of them to have a clear visual identity. Mm -hmm. And this would be true for any, any additional subclass we might design uh, for the artificer. First, so each one, clear visual identity. Second, I wanted to be able to have a story justification for each one in Eberron. Mm. So you'll notice when I talk about the artillerist here, yes. uh, there's just this sentence uh, right at the beginning that says, artillerists were valued by all the armies of the last war. For those of you unfamiliar with Eberron, the last war it was the catastrophic continental war that just wrapped up. Uh, this, was, this was a war uh, that was so shocking to the nations of the continent of Corvair that everyone really hopes it was indeed the last war, the, the war to end all wars. <laughs> Not just the last war that had occurred. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, we know from our own world's history that that's how many people viewed World War I. <laughs> and sadly, their hope yeah. that it was the war to end all wars did not come to pass. Mm -hmm. uh, the world of Eberron, uh, given all of the conflicts brewing there, uh, could be in a very similar circumstance where this supposed war to end all wars might actually just be setting the stage for something even more dire. So the idea with the artillerist is this isn't just someone who's good at blowing things up. This is someone who in on the battlefield of the last war was bringing out firepower but also able to create uh, defensive positions. Uh, because again, this wasn't just someone walking around in a dungeon, mm -hmm. this was someone on a battlefield. And that's, that motivated uh, some of the spell choices uh, that we made. That's why, you know, I mentioned last time you have these wall spells. Right. Um, it is also why uh, the artillerist gets this turret, uh, which allows the artillerist uh, to not only lay down fire, uh, but also uh, to block up 
positions mm -hmm. uh, because the, the turret actually takes up space. Um, but we also, because one of the themes of the artificer is versatility, wanted the artillerist to have some options when it comes to the turret. And so the turret right now has three uh, options. Basically, when you create it, you get, it, you get to decide if it's a flamethrower, a force ballista, or a defender. Uh, the flamethrower is uh, how you can lay down some area damage as it uh, exhales fire uh, out in front of it. Uh, I will say, uh, sort of a little look behind the curtain, uh, I consider the flamethrower to be under-tuned right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it either needs its area increased or its damage increased. Uh, it's sort of one of those things that the instant we sent it out into the world and I was glancing through the class, I was like, oh, that could be better. <laughs> uh, uh, the force ballista is a, is a solid amount of damage uh, with a nice range and it also can hurl people back uh, because of the magic force uh, colliding into them. And then finally, there's the, the defender, where you can have your turret uh, provide temporary hit points uh, to people within 10 feet of it. Mm. Uh, and I wanted this here so that not only could the artificer be versatile, but also because I know some people often their biggest joy in a co-op game like D&D is helping their friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I often like to work in, uh, when it feels appropriate into a subclass, some option where you can help your buddies uh, in addition to uh, laying out some damage. Uh, after the turret, uh, which one of my favorite things about it is it has legs so it can move around. Yeah, the crab-like legs. Yes. That, uh, yes. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, one of the things I can tell you already that I would expect in a future iteration of this is more options for the artillerist to customize the appearance of the turret. Mm. Uh, that's something I wrote into the Alchemist where I'm, I encourage the Alchemist player to determine the look of their alchemical homunculus. Uh, you can expect similar text here in the turret at some point. Uh, I've even been toying with the idea of, in a future version, allowing you uh, to make, to also determine the turret size mm -hmm. and potentially have it be tiny. And so have, instead of it being something that's walking around, it essentially can function like a gun mm -hmm. uh, if you don't want this big turret uh, walking around with you and instead it, want it like perched on your shoulder or hold it in hand. Ah. Uh, and well, as a fan of Predator, I <laughs> endorse that option highly. And I, I, by the way, as a designer, love providing aesthetic options like that, mm -hmm. which often do not have an appreciable effect on the balance of the class, yeah. and really just allow people to create the aesthetic for their character that they desire. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always love doing that. I, I, I agree. I think that's important not just to offer options for the aesthetics, but even just to sort of open the mentality that there are aesthetic choices that you might make yourself mm -hmm. as a player, giving them sort of the green light to do so. Uh, we had a couple of questions uh, that had come in previously regarding the turrets. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Defender turret, Quarry Thunderclaw asks, uh, the effect on the Defender turret, is that a one-time effect? or can it be activated multiple times while the turret is in effect? I know temporary hit points don't stack, but it stands out to me uh, given how e easy it is, uh, seems to refill temporary hit points. So this, e each of the turrets, they have this activation effect. That activation effect occurs every time you take your bonus action to activate the turret. Okay. And so yes, the defender turret is meant to emit uh, this magical pulse of energy that gives mm. people temporary hit points every time you activate it. Well, so rally around the defender. Yes. If you mm -hmm. are in the midst of a, of a, a slog fest here. Yep. Uh, and uh, as, as the questioner rightly pointed out, everyone keep in mind temporary hit points do not stack. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever you gain temporary hit points, if you already have temporary hit points, you decide which ones to keep. Uh, and that means you have to be careful. If let's say you're under the effect of something else, say a spell, 
that gives you temporary hit points and says, while you have these temporary hit points, this other effect is in place. If you accept these other ah. temporary hit points and they overwrite <laughs> those other ones, you're going to shut that spell off. Right. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is, as I like to say, a juicy uh, feature. <laughs> uh, you're giving up the uh, nice damage output of the turret to use it. Mm -hmm. It's also location locked. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also a, a balancing factor. Uh, I'm, I've, I've said before on this show as well as on the Sage Advice podcast, I actually really like using temporary hit points because they're self-limiting, mm -hmm. uh, because they don't stack. Uh, also keep in mind if you're at zero hit points and you get temporary hit points, they do not uh, wake you up. Uh, really the best way to think of temporary hit points is it's a kind of um, resilience. Uh, it's like a blade of armor uh, that gets whittled away before your real hit points uh, start being mm. affected. Um, so you're not going to ladder up, but you can recharge your temporary yes. hit points yep. by proximity to the... To the mm -hmm. Uh, DX asked, uh, love the way the Artificer came around this time, but as always, people have lots of questions, myself included. Any thoughts on adding more scaling to the turrets? So right now, uh, the turrets are actually, in terms of their output, other than the flamethrower, uh, are solid uh, when it comes to their output over the course of your levels. The reason for this is that they are a bonus ac action. If, say, you have a Force Ballista out, this is free damage for you. Uh, and so this is, this is basically always good. It's never going to go out of style no matter how high level you are. <laughs> because it's always you're just adding this on to whatever the game has already balanced for you to be able to do. Now, that all said, one thing I am considering is the possibility of some kind of increase uh, it, through the use of uh, spell slots. Mm -hmm. uh, because we do allow you uh, to burn spell slots uh, to summon the turret, uh, and there could be a power increase uh, that is tied to the expenditure of those slots. Mm. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks for the, the questions mm -hmm. on the turrets. Uh, the one prototype fortified position, anything you wanted to touch upon there or going back to the Artificer in general? Yes, so I, I touched on this briefly last time, but I want to pause on it again because I know some people have wondered uh, why this mix of the turret and the wand prototype in this subclass. Mm -hmm. First off, there's a thematic unity in that it, it is all about shooting, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> shooting and defensive positions. Uh, the reason why the wand is here is A, wand slinging is a big deal in the world of Eberron. But also, as, as I wrote in the little introductory uh, section for the artillerist, wands are basically the sidearms of not only artificers, but many uh, people you'd meet on the battlefield in the world of Eberron. And so I, I thought if anyone in this class was going to be good at using wands, it would be the artillerist, uh, this person who has this sidearm uh, that they can use uh, to defend themselves uh, and their friends uh, when they are uh, standing at one of these defensive positions that they've created. Uh, so that's the thinking there. Uh, the wand prototype uh, gives you yet even more versatility uh, because of your, your cantrip options that you get to place within it. And then at 14th level, you get your fortified position. Uh, this gives you the magical half cover uh, while within 10 feet of a turret that you've created. And it also now lets you have two turrets out uh, at, at the same time. Uh, and one of the beauties here is the two turrets do not have to be the same type. Keep that in mind. You could, for instance, summon out a force ballista and then a defender uh, and, and mix, mix these up. Now imagine the defender out combined with fortified positions, magical half cover, and oh boy, do you have a fortified <laughs> position. Uh, that the emplacement that you have created, uh, I can imagine in some dungeons, an artillerist laying you know, this down, creating some choke point mm -hmm. in a hallway, it could be devastating. Uh, and if they, have, if they are there with a second artificer who is an alchemist, if then the alchemist 
uh, lets loose cloud kill down that hallway, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> And uh, good for the goose, right? I mean, uh, DMs should also uh, keep in mind some of these tactics and strategies if they ever want to create uh, enemy artificers. Oh, power. yes. I, uh, I would love uh, to see DMs and adventure writers mm -hmm. riff on some of the material here in our villains yeah. uh, because there could be some terrifying <laughs> situations uh, for the player characters. Oh, absolutely. You've got your, your standard uh, minions, but all of a sudden you have a defender turret that they can flock back to and recover. It's like, oh, man, that's, that's, that's not good. Uh, one thing I uh, before we move on from the artillerists that I'd like to point out, uh, simply, uh, basically, this is me, me uh, confessing. Uh, I will confess that I put in the ability to detonate your turrets just because it made me giggle so much. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are sometimes things uh, that we will design where it's really just because we're at our desks giggling. And for some <laughs> reason, I just love the idea of creating this position mm -hmm. and then running. And as the monsters are coming in, you blow up your, your turrets. But it still feels very much in line with the concept of this battlefield character. Absolutely. Who's like, we're losing our position. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't let these fall into the enemy hands. Right. Sabotage them mm -hmm. and, and go. But you, here's the thing. You can also use them offensively. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine uh, the, art, the artificer directing the turret to start moving toward. <laughs> and if the opponents know what's up, you know, especially in the last war, if they'd fought a bunch of, you know, on the battlefield, a bunch of these people with these crab leg turrets going across the battlefield, they would be trying to gun those turrets down before they got to them because they thought, oh, that thing's going to blow up in our face. Well, see, as a player, then I would take an ice cream cart and cover the <laughs> turret with it. And so it would just be an innocent ice cream. Like, oh, we can't wait for this thing to get here. And then kaboom. Oh, my gosh. So when people start customizing the look of their turrets, <laughs> yeah. someone out there do the ice cream truck one. I love it. With a little, with a little music right. playing. Right, it plays the song. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and all, every monster has learned to be terrified of those, the ice cream jingle. Those poor kobolds <laughs> who have lined up uh, with their hard-earned coppers to get some ice cream. When I was a kid, it was always the jingle from the Sting soundtrack. I don't know why, but that was, that was the ice cream truck uh, jingle. Oh, my goodness. I don't remember the name of the song. In any case, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Some, some fodder for adventures and, uh, and, and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, it was funny. I was, I was just uh, poking around the etymology background of wand. There actually is some connection to wall as well. Mm, interesting. So, there you go. There is huh. a wand wall uh, connection. So, also makes sense there. Uh, all right. Uh, some more questions. Did you want to go back to the uh, artificer in general? Yeah, let's go back to the artificer okay. in general. So after you dive into being either an alchemist or an artillerist, yes, uh, you then get your ability score improvements just like every other class does. And then at fifth level, you get this feature called arcane armament. Yes. And I remember we had a question about arcane armament. Uh, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. And uh, as you talk about that, I will find it. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, here, yes. here we are. The yep. Angel Alf. Angel Alf. Do you see arcane armament competing with cantrips? Are you expecting an artificer to attack twice with a magical simple weapon? That is a great question. Arcane armament, I have noticed as I've looked on Reddit, on Twitter, and elsewhere online, uh, at people's responses uh, to the class, mm -hmm. I've seen that arcane armament has sparked <clears throat> the most questions, and understandably so. Uh, this is honestly an example of us possibly going overboard with versatility. Uh, we wanted the artificer to be have have cool options in almost every circumstance, mm -hmm. and that included. Uh, the option to rely on their cantrips for their sort of basic attacks mm -hmm. uh, or uh, rely on their weapons and specifically uh, magic weapons, which can include uh, weapons that bear one of the artificer's infusions. So to the player where they want the option to basically play however they want, having both potent cantrips 
and the option to essentially have extra attack with weapons, they'll love that versatility. But there are many players we have found over the years uh, when we look at playtest feedback who like a class to give sort of a clearer path when it comes to its play style. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a very good chance in the next iteration of the entire class that uh, arcane armament would get folded into uh, a subclass uh, and, then the, and then we might uh, handle uh, upping your damage potential in some other way. Um, so right now, really, this is simply here for the sake of versatility. Uh, we, we are not trying to force anyone's hand uh, uh, in terms of play style, and quite the contrary, the whole point was to give you options when it comes to play style. Uh, but uh, the questioner is absolutely right that there is a lot of incentive uh, in the artillerist and the alchemist mm -hmm. uh, to rely on cantrips. Uh, and so in a typical combat, I would expect uh, members of those subclasses to be using their cantrips rather than uh, relying on arcane armament. All righty. Uh, at 10th level, uh, artificers get something that I think many <laughs> spellcasters would love to have, and that is the ability every day if you want to change one of the artificer cantrips you know with another cantrip from the artificer spell list. Most characters, when they learn their cantrips, they know them, they know them for life. Uh, not the artificer. The artificer, if he or she wants, uh, can tinker, try out uh, different options, and uh, see what their sort of favorite cantrip list I, is. I, it feels, uh, in, in the real world, you would always have the right-sized battery for whatever toy uh, requires one. Yep. Uh, uh, yes. So yeah, uh, cantrips are, are fun, uh, versatile spells, and this gives them a, even more versatility in the hands of, of the artificer. At 18th level, you get the spell storing item. Uh, this allows you, as the name suggests, to store uh, spells in an item for use at a later time. Now, in the previous version of the Artificer, this was available at a lower level. Uh, right now, it's sitting up at 18th level. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it got cut from the lower levels partly because of how much spell casting, general versatility, and magic item infusions that we are giving you at lower levels. So we're already giving you so many ways to give yourself and your friends portable magic, there was less pressure in the design for us at low level to also let you put your spells mm. uh, in objects. Um, because also partly because your general spell casting is actually via objects. We'll look at the playtest feedback. Uh, if we see a lot of desire uh, for this bit of versatility to be at lower levels, mm -hmm. that's definitely something we can look at. And that's the kind of change I'm expecting mm -hmm. uh, with this with this class. Now that it now that it feels like it's on solid ground, mm -hmm. I could see us essentially, you know, changing the volume on some things uh, or shifting things around more than like completely overhauling things. Right. Unless I'm again completely mis <laughs> misreading <laughs> the feedback. Finally, Soul of Artifice at 20th level, this is where you get uh, the ability to attune to up to six magic yeah. items at once. And this is that's just bonkers. This is, this is the juicy of the uh, the juicy abilities. Here. And then you also get a saving throw bonus uh, to go along with it. Uh, in the previous version of the artificer, uh, we and I might have mentioned this in the previous episode, uh, giving you the ability to attune to more than three I magic items at once uh, appeared at lower levels. We ended up removing mm -hmm. that from uh, this version of the class because it, it became unnecessary. Mm -hmm. uh, given the items that are now on the magic item infusion list, uh, there are now enough options that do not require attunement. Mm -hmm. There was no need for the artificer to have extra attunement uh, options at lower levels. Okay. Uh, this really, like so many of our 20th level abilities, is really just here as this sort of aspirational thing. If you get here, awesome, have a ball with it. Um, uh, but again, we'll look at the playtest feedback and, and see what you all think. 
when it comes to the item infusions, so the artificer infusions are at the, the end of the class. Right now, we have a mix of, of infusions that are specific to the class and then a bunch of magic items that the artificer is able to replicate. And as the artificer goes up in level, the magic items that they're able to replicate, the number of those items increases uh, as, as shown on the tables here in the class. This is really a toy store of options. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you look at all of the different items that you're able to make uh, from, you know, boots of levitation to helms of telepathy to sending stones to everyone's favorite alchemy jug for when you need more mayonnaise than anyone can possibly consume. Uh, you, it's all here. <clears throat> then, oh, that remind, we, didn't we concoct one? I don't know if it was on air or off the air last time. It was a version of the alchemy jug specific to Girl Scout cookies. Oh, yes. <laughs> where you could, you could convert one yes. into a different variety yep. of Girl Scout cookie of your choosing. Yeah. And then <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned for, for that right. important bit uh, yeah. of D&D &D design. There's my play to the state <laughs> girl, girl, and specifically, I, I know what you want is a thin mint dispenser. No, a, a, well, an anti-thin, I feed it thin mints to get rid of them <laughs> and come back with. And convert them into other cookies. Any, <clears throat> a, literally any other cookie. Uh, so uh, you'll notice that a number of the infusions that are not uh, magic items that you're replicating, many of them are about increasing uh, the artificer's effectiveness in combat. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to, or, not just the artificer, whoever, whoever in the party ends up benefiting from this infusion. Uh, and that includes enhancing your defense, you, the weapon you're using. Uh, you can create the delightful many-handed pouch, uh, which I expect many hijinks uh, <laughs> to arise from in many campaigns. Uh, the resistant armor, the returning weapon. Uh, these are all ways uh, for the artificer. If the artificer is uh, themselves focused on weapon use, uh, this is a way to increase that effectiveness. Also, one of the fun things to remember, and we got a question about this, mm -hmm. is any item uh, that uh, bears one of your infusions, and I mentioned this last episode, uh, can be used as a spellcasting focus. And so I've gotten questions, you know, like if I if I make a bag of holding, can I cast my spells from it? Yes, you can. Uh, yes. So, sorry, we're a uh, network issue, but I don't. Uh, are we still? We're still live. Oh, okay. we are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, folks, we've got an internal network issue, but we are still uh, live streaming out. We're just slightly blind uh, to the to the uh, chat at, right, at the right. moment. Yes, that was uh, Tyrell Terrell had, had asked specifically: Can these be used as spell uh, casting focus mm -hmm. foci? Uh, Daedalus had also asked: uh, What was the purpose of making it so infusions and arcane weapons don't work with natural weapons? Ah, so the whole shtick of the artificer uh, is that you are channeling magic through objects mm -hmm. uh, rather than through other people or, or, other, or other monsters' body parts. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that generally in the game is uh, the domain of the monk. We occasionally make exceptions, uh, but we are actually uh, cautious about uh, inadvertently bulldozing uh, the monk's uh, sort of archetypal terrain. Uh, and it's also a terrain shared by the druid, uh, especially Circle of the Moon druids who rely on uh, shapeshifting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so there we go with, uh, with some thoughts on, uh, on infusions. Uh, we had a couple more. Uh, Alkana, Alkana had asked, the level progression in the replicate magic item infusion is very strange. Ten items are available for replication from the start, but they don't gain any more until 12th where they suddenly gain 26 more. And then at 16th level, they acquire 12 more. 
Is this going to change at any point? Or sort of, I guess, what's, what are the thoughts behind the, uh, the math here? So, so the number of items available at these three stages uh, in the replicate magic item infusion, mm -hmm. uh, the number is actually has no meaning uh, in terms of our game design. Mm -hmm. These are simply the items we found going through the Dungeon Master's Guide right. that were appropriate for an artificer to be able to replicate at these particular levels. Mm -hmm. So the number is just a function of what we designed in the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, five or six years ago. Uh, and, and so if there, were, if there were more appropriate items in the DMG that could go on the lower level list, they would appear there. Um, you could uh, imagine the many of the common items in Xanathar's Guide actually being on that lower level mm. list. But right now, uh, the Artificer is using only material uh, that's in uh, the core books rather than in uh, a supplementary book mm. like Xanathar's Guide. Uh, but I did mention in the last episode that we do plan uh, the next time we release Artificer content to include a list of spells from Xanathar's Guide that would be appropriate to add to the Artificer spell list. Uh, and we could also look at uh, adding some of the common items uh, mm -hmm. from that book uh, to the Replicate Magic Item Infusion. Uh, you, there, yes, there were quite a few questions that had come in regarding Xanathar's Guide to Everything and mm -hmm. the Artificer, mm -hmm. uh, the spell lists, which you, you just mentioned as well. Uh, Stonehill had asked about uh, Xanathar's Guide's uh, uh, sections on crafting magic items and how they might work in conjunction with the Artificer. Uh, as well. Uh, well. So I can answer that question. Uh, <clears throat> right now, uh, the Artificer, uh, depending on your subclass, has uh, a, an ability to make certain types of magic items more efficiently. Uh, for instance, if you are an alchemist, uh, you get the tools of the trade feature, and that allows you to craft potions uh, taking a quarter amount of a, a, a quarter of the normal time and costing you half as much as the of the usual gold. This feature works whether you're using the crafting rules in Xanathar's guide or the crafting rules in the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide. We designed it to work with either one. Uh, the same is true for the artillerist who is more efficient at creating wands. Mm -hmm. uh, also uh, because the Artificer has so many tool proficiencies, if you are using the crafting rules in Xanathar's Guide, that means the Artificer is going to be more likely able to make more items. The reason being, if you're not familiar with the Xanathar's rules, is that some items for you to make them require proficiency with certain tools. Mm -hmm. And so the Artificer is the person right now most likely to have those proficiencies because they have such a truckload uh, of proficiencies. <laughs> uh, we had a couple questions about tools. Uh, how does the rule on holding tools interact with casting spells that has uh, S but no M? <laughs> ah, yeah. That is <laughs> that semantic is but no material. Uh, will it be ignored there, or do they have to fiddle with hand economy like other casters? So uh, that's a great, very technical question. Uh, <laughs> the intent is for the artificer to not have to worry about that distinction between uh, somatic spells that have a material component right. and somatic spells uh, that don't. Uh, and so that, that's a clarification you can expect to see in a future version of the class. I can, I can see an artificer crafting like a, a mechanical hand just to do <laughs> somatic spell components. <clears throat> yeah, <'Cause, laughs> because since, since we are requiring you as an artificer to have something in hand that you're casting with, mm -hmm. uh, you, it is not our design intention for you to sort of be extra punished <laughs> when it comes to wondering what's in my hands. A mechanical uh, hand. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe you you have a mechanical hand that's holding another mechanical right. hand. Right, it's all heads. It's that's holding a stack <laughs> of centaurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hand of the hydra. Uh, uh, and and uh, just one more from tools, something like that asked uh, about the alchemist satchel. 
and uh, where that went, if it didn't fit in with the overall design or uh, how that might have uh, played out. Oh, right, right. This is a, uh, I believe, a reference to the previous version yes. of the class. Yes. Um, so it's funny. Uh, it basically got devoured by the spell options that the class now has mm -hmm. uh, and also the capabilities of the alchemical uh, homunculus. Uh, again, one of those views behind the curtain moments. Uh, I actually originally designed the alchemical homunculus uh, as an ability to create vials that contained the special abilities that the homunculus mm -hmm. now has. Because you know how the homunculus has this ability to basically spit out different uh, magical effects? Yes. That was originally actually some vials that you were creating. Ah. Um, I switched it because in looking at the Eberron source material, artificers uh, all had the ability to create homunculi. I mentioned in our last episode that alchemists in real-world folklore uh, made golems and homunculi. And we're also looking at uh, the visual profile of this class. What, when you saw a lineup of characters, what's going to make this person stand out? Mm -hmm. And a character having this little mechanical flying uh, critter uh, is certainly one way to set it apart from, say, a transmuter wizard who might also be pouring vials. Right. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that the alchemist wasn't just a different version of the transmuter. One of my favorite characters in all of comic books is uh, Gyro Gyrolus. Gyro Gyrolus. Uh, I'm not sure I know who that is. Oh, I'll send you a link. Uh -huh. uh, he's from Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Oh, okay. He was, their, he was their inventor duck in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. And he had uh, somebody called a little helper. And a little helper was like a mechanical homunculus with a light bulb for a head. <laughs> and and it, it fits. It, it fits <clears throat> perfectly. So, <throat> yeah, I'll, I'll have to send you a, a link to it, to a little helper. Yeah. That was great. That's oh. a great character. Fabulous. <laughs> uh, now, that all said, something like the satchel could make a reappearance uh, as uh, an infusion option mm -hmm. uh, that isn't specific to the alchemist. Uh, really quickly here, I know we're getting close to uh, the, the top of the hour. Uh, I know the cartoon was called DuckTales. There was a, even before that, <laughs> there was the, the Donald Duck comic books from Carl Banks, who was a fantastic comic writer. And uh, he was in there. But yeah, and DuckTales was a great uh, com uh, cartoon version of that. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, but I did want to mention uh, with everything going on with PAX East, uh, live streaming schedules are a bit in flux for a lot of streamers. Uh, there is no Heroes of the Veil uh, coming on next, so uh, we'll run past two uh, a little bit long uh, as needed here. Uh, we will have, uh, I believe, the second raffle is uh, up and uh, if it hasn't closed out, it'll be closing out soon. So thanks for everyone for tuning in, uh, uh, joining for that as well. And again, really quickly, uh, we'll be streaming D&D content from PAX East, hosting the PAX channel throughout the weekend, including Jeremy Crawford's uh, Acquisitions Incorporated game as well. Uh, I will be traveling a bit myself, uh, so we will be off for, for two weeks here. I'll be in uh, London uh, next week for the EGX Resd convention, gaming convention, uh, and also just to get over to London. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the following week, I'll be at uh, TwitchCon EU in Berlin. So anyone in London or Berlin, uh, <laughs> hit me up on Twitter. We'll, we'll go out for a pint. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, we have had a truckload of questions come in during this chat as well. Uh, I didn't want to, uh, to, uh, to neglect those, uh, just to let you know that we are collecting those, collating those, uh, and we'll, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can in a future episode as, as we've done today for the last round of questions. Uh, that have come in. So uh, as we get close to the top of the hour, is there one more topic that you wanted to 
touch upon here for the artificer. Do you I mean, have Do you have any other Do you have another question? We have hit me with? many questions. <coughs> uh, Nathan Doyle had asked, "Was there ever a time when you considered a schematic book?" With the the thought of which I I love for artificers. Uh, we're like wizards. They can know all the things, but it isn't the default. Uh, so I think it is a super fun idea. Uh, right now, it's not in the class because uh, we have uh, not only not only the way their spells work, but also you get item infusions, and also you can swap out your cantrips. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many sort of moving parts. Yeah. Uh, the idea of also giving them essentially a spell book to manage <laughs> uh, is a bit much, uh, but it's possible that as we refine the class, if certain parts of it start becoming a bit more elegant, mm -hmm. that might open up space for something like this. I, and I can see it potentially as a, 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 like a scroll that you would come across mm -hmm. in the wild, mm -hmm. like, oh, here's mm -hmm. a schematic for something an artificer uh, could, could use. Uh, we had, let me find uh, a few more. Doodly -doo, doodly -doo, doodly -doo. We covered spells. Uh, oh, you know, here we go. Alcana uh, had asked, are there plans? Uh, so first, let me, let me preface this from Pastor Bastard asked, are there more artificer subclasses in the works? There's a good chance there are. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, and is uh, follow-up question: Are there plans for all artificer subclasses, uh, present and potentially future, to have a deployable pet-like creature, or is this going to be localized more to the alchemist and artillerist? So the plan is uh, for the cl for every subclass to have something that you deploy in the world. Uh, and that's because this class is all about making things, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, through uh, making magical, ef magical effects through objects or infusing magic items or through their subclass abilities. Uh, I wouldn't say everything is necessarily going to be what you would call a pet. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we kind of have, you know, we have the, the ha we have the pet in the alchemist and we have a a mobile uh, object uh, in the artillerist. Uh, you'll see. I'm I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just say that you'll see. I'm trying to It'll distract be Jeremy with uh, Google Images for little helpers. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, so he's, yes, he's a handy. Dandy, yeah, and he can also you know he he cobbles things together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ah, all right. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Wow, we're, we actually uh, got through a lot of uh, the questions that had come in. Uh, uh, let me ask one more here then. Zenferno asks, thoughts on getting more oomph when you use higher level slots on the turret or homunculus? Yes. Okay. There are thoughts on that. Yes, and, I, and, <laughs> yeah, and we, we will explore that as a possibility. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite features was putting a spell into an object for use by others. Now this has been relegated to 18th level. Any chance of a change there? Uh, the and as I mentioned, might the playtest play test feedback will determine uh, if we change that. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I think why don't we call that a wrap? Uh, we are a little bit past the 2 o'clock hour. As always, thanks to everyone for spending an hour of your afternoon, uh, um, Pacific time, <laughs> with us on the Dragon Plus live stream. Uh, again, uh, as always, in support of Dragon Plus, our free digital magazine app. It's on iOS, it's on Android, it's on dragonmag.com. Uh, Jeremy Crawford, our guest every other week, as, uh, as always. And uh, please do tune in to the Acquisitions Inc. game this weekend that Jeremy will be dungeon mastering at PAX East. Uh, thanks, everyone, so much uh, for watching. Thanks to our followers, subscribers. Thanks, as always, to our moderators as well. And of course, uh, thanks to Pelham Green for manning the controls and <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a different studio audience applauding for yes, him. Certainly yes. not Pelham applauding for himself. All, all that person <laughs> applauding for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, congratulations to our raffle winners. As mentioned, we'll be looking to vodcast for a couple of weeks here. 
Uh, but we will be back just as soon as convention season gives us a little window of opportunity. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for uh, giving us an hour of your time to talk through the Artificer. Uh, we, we know, as mentioned, uh, look for the survey. It will be coming down the road. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to mention, say, announce for the Artificer, or uh, just uh, we'll see you at PAX East? Yeah, hope to see you all at PAX East. And I uh, look forward to having more conversations about the Artificer and other D&D things in the months ahead. All right, sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.